You and I are in probably one of the most trying times of our generation. There's so much fear, so much uncertainty, so much unknown. Every week, it's almost every day on a 24 hour basis, the conditions change for how you and I live and what are we supposed to do. Some friends of mine and I, your neighbors from here in Columbus, we decided we would like to reach out to you in this season to give you some light on the situation, to give you some encouragement and give you some hope. So today, I wanna to welcome you to my home because you're probably in your home. That's the situation we're all in. And we're gonna to look together and see, are there answers, is there hope, is there a way through the situation we're in? Please stay with me. My father's a veterinarian and I love animal stories. I, I grew up around animals and I was wondering, have you ever heard of the Iditarod? It's this great race in Alaska. It's a sled race. They take dogs and they race 938 miles to Nome, Alaska in the freezing weather of March. Well, it all started actually back in 1925. In 1925, in Nome, Alaska, they had an outbreak of black diphtheria. It was a terrible disease. It, it caused the, a thickening of the throat where you couldn't breathe and you died. Now, the good news was we had developed uh, an antitoxin. We had developed a way to treat it so that people could live. That's another amazing story. They learned that if they took some of the diphtheria and they gave it to horses, and the horses that overcame through their blood, they could get the antitoxin and then they could give it to us. The good news is the horses didn't have to die. They just took a, a, a pint to four pints of blood and they kept making more and more antitoxin and giving it to people. Well, in January of 1925, they have this outbreak of diphtheria in Nome, Alaska. There's only one doctor there and a few nurses and it, he actually, realizes that it's diphtheria and it's too late. Too many people are already starting to get it. Kind of the way we feel right now. We're in the midst of this situation. We're like, well, do too many people have it? How do you contain it? That's what they did. They put them on lockdown. No one could go outside of Nome. And they met as a city and they said, what are we gonna do to get more antitoxin? How are we gonna get the diphtheria medicine? They talked about planes in 1925. Planes were coming in, but guess what? It was too cold. They didn't really feel like they could use planes at that time. They had this, this famous guy from Norway. He was a dog sledder. He was known for doing over 100 miles in one day. They said, if we set up a string of dog sledders, maybe we could bring all the antitoxin across the cold winter weather. Now realize this, it's 1925. It's, terribly cold in Nome, Alaska. I mean, it's one of the coldest years they've ever had. Just a few years before that, they lost over half of the Eskimo population to the Spanish flu. They were freaked out. They decided to put a string of sledders together and they began to bring up the antitoxin to the city of Nome. These men, they almost gave their lives. Many of them experienced frostbite, Many of the dogs died, but that's how they got through. You may be asking yourself, why is this important for you and I? The day that they got the news that diphtheria had come to Nome, it was a dark day. It was a bad day. But the day that the antitoxin revived, it was a great day. They were so excited. Their plan had worked. Their effort had worked. And you and I right now, we're kind of in the dark day. We're in the hard time right now. And I want to invite you to imagine that you and I are a team and we have an answer. We have hope that we can share with our neighbors. We can help one another. You know, there have been movies that have been made about it. And you may not even realize the backstory. If you saw the children's movie, Balto, that's about one of the dogs from the dog sled that brought the, the antitoxin all the way to Nome. Today, you and I can carry hope and life to our neighbors. What if you would just call five people every day? Just check on them, the same five people. Maybe they're elder, maybe they're people at risk and just check on them. That could be the lifeline that someone needs. See, you and I, we can be a part of a team of people bringing mercy and hope and love in this time. I wanna invite you to, 
to look with me at, at Jesus and his story and his entering in. I want us to get a big picture idea of what God was doing. And I want us to look for the good days and the bad days and never forget who we are and the kind of people that we want to be. Today, I wanted to invite you into my home. I wanted to spend a little bit of time with you and try to unpack the situation we're in and, and look at it through the lens of what God would say. One of the things that I've learned in my life is this, that it's easy for us to get busy in life and to get going or to get confused or overwhelmed by a situation and to go through that situation and never realize what God's really trying to say. So today, I want to invite you just to sit down, slow down with me, and let's think, what might God be saying to us? See, our whole world has been turned kind of upside down, or at least sideways. We're doing things differently. We're all Zooming. Uh, we're all online in some way or another. But what if we were to slow down and say, okay, God, what is it you're saying in the midst of this? The Bible tells us an amazing story. It tells us the story of Jesus. In John chapter 14, Jesus invites us to look at him and engage him as though he is the way, the truth, and the life. And today, I want to invite you to think about that. In John chapter 12, Jesus comes to Jerusalem. The night that he arrives, he goes to his friend's house. He goes to Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And the reason they're significant is they've been friends for a while. The Bible tells us that they loved one another. They were people that hung out together. They spent time together. They had parties in their home and they did life together. Jesus was a real person. Sometimes we forget that. And it says in John chapter 12 that Jesus came and they were celebrating because Lazarus was back from the dead. That's another story in John chapter 11, a powerful story that God can raise the dead, that God has power of life and death, that God can engage you and I in eternity. On this night, on this night, Jesus sat with his friends and he celebrated. He gets up the next day in John 12, verses 12 and 13. It says that, that Jesus went out and he approached Jerusalem. He looked over the city. I had the pleasure of living in Jerusalem for two years of my life, studying the Bible, getting to know the people, walking the streets. I know they're not the same streets as Jesus. Some of them are still from the Roman times there that you can see now. But, but I would sit and imagine what was it like to be with Jesus there? And I would look over the city I remember one day in particular going to the Mount of Olives and just sitting there and imagining what it was like when Jesus came in on that day. I looked over the city and I began to see the palm branches and the people humbling themselves and throwing their coats out. In, in the ancient world, their coats was like their car. They, they had value. They, they had worth. And, and they, would, they threw their coats out before Jesus. I mean, I can't imagine that. What a humbling experience. On this day, they're throwing their coats out, they're waving the palm branches, and Jesus looks over the city. As I sit here, I look over the city on a regular basis. I pray for the city, I pray for you. I pray, God, what is it you're doing in the world? I've been praying that for, for years now. And today, the whole world is shaken and you and I are asking questions about our life. We're asking, where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? And what I want to invite you to is this. We all have our good days and we all have our bad days. Palm Sunday, yes, it was a good day for Jesus. But he also knew he had a difficult day ahead. He was well aware of it. That's what John tells us in this gospel in chapter 12. He understood completely what was ahead of him. And God invites you and I to trust Him in the good days and the bad days. Never forget who you are and never forget why you're here. That's what Jesus did. Jesus knew exactly who He was and why He was here. On this day, He was reaching into the bag of history. He was pulling up the life of the kings of Israel. He sits on this donkey, just like the ancient kings of Israel rode a donkey. It was a symbol that, that God still cared about your life. Very common, not a, a high, powerful, wealthy. No, no, it, it's like driving a Chevy or a Ford.
He was like the people and they were celebrating. They were excited. They were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. It was reflective of the prophets. See, Jesus realized that his life was to be reflective of what God was doing in the earth. His life was to be reflective of scripture. And so scripture always shines light onto our situation. So I want to invite you, humble yourself before God. Begin to pray. Say, God, what is it you're doing in the earth right now? Begin to go to the scripture and begin to read it and say, God, are you, is there some message here? Is there something for me that I need to do? Is there something I need to adjust? Is there some way that my posture needs to change? Can I tell you for myself, it's been humbling. There have been times when I've gotten on my knees and I've said, oh, God, forgive me. I've cared too much about being entertained. God, forgive me. I've, I've been into my schedule and my time and what I wanted to do. And that's all come to a halt lately, hasn't it? What if you and I took the next five weeks and spent a little time together right here in our homes with God and each other? Would you consider that? Keep going with me. And let's take some time to see how important your life is and how God's plan for your life is important in the midst of this. Let's not let go of this moment. Let's take it and say, okay, God, what do you have for me? One of the things I love about the Bible is it gives us God's big picture. You know, God's big picture is clearly established in Scripture. And John tells us that when God is ready or we're ready, His Holy Spirit is going to bring back to remembrance God's Scripture. So we can begin to see our lives in light of Scripture. And I think one of the reasons that a lot of people right now are, are really kind of on pins and needles. They're on the edge of their seat. They're trying to figure out, well, is God doing something? If the whole world's been touched, there's got to be something bigger going on. And so people are diving into the scripture and I invite you to dive in with me. But realize sometimes it's easy to miss the big picture. Sometimes we are so busy in these situations that we miss the big picture. Listen to this. This is actually from the Gospel of John. It's, it's chapter 12 again, verse 16. It says that the disciples missed the big picture. It says his disciples didn't realize at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus returned to his glory in heaven, then they noticed how many prophecies of Scripture had come true before their eyes. See, it was after the fact, it was after this event of Jesus coming into Jerusalem and, and, and all the people throwing down their cloaks that they realized this is a fulfillment of prophecy. This was, this was all God's doing. And see, you and I, now that we're here in the middle of it, we can kind of look in and see what God is doing. God is doing something. In this Easter season, right now, Palm Sunday through Easter, let's take a look at what God is doing. Notice how patient God was with them. That's what I love about scripture. They didn't get everything right. They didn't always understand what was going on while it was going on. But then God began to explain it through his Holy Spirit. I invite you to invite the Holy Spirit into your home. Say, God, help me understand. Open your Bible and pray and begin to read it. Just be intentional every day about giving God time and space and see what he teaches you. Not long ago, Jennifer and I were here at home and we're flipping through and I saw Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. I kind of like Sherlock Holmes because it was written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Duh, right? I'm Doyle. So I kind of feel like I have to know something about Sherlock Holmes. So I said, let's watch this episode. And in this episode, there's this powerful story. John Watson, his assistant, is married to Mary. And in the scene, forgive me, spoil alert, I may ruin this for you, Mary dives in front of a bullet and saves Sherlock's life. It tears the relationship apart for Watson and Sherlock. They are now broken apart in their relationship because she's died. Now, Watson on one side over here, he's upset because he's lost the love of his life. And, and he loses her because she 
once again does something to save Sherlock. It's like Sherlock is always ruining his life and messing it up. But also inside, he's really upset because he didn't get to deal with some stuff in his relationship with Mary that was going on at the time. And so really what's going on is he brings his home relationship into this relationship with this other person. Sherlock on the other side of the coin, he's upset because he realizes what's happened to him. And in this scene, they sit down and they talk it out. And, and Watson looks at Sherlock and says, it's not your fault. You didn't kill Mary. You don't get to, to own all of that. Mary chose to dive in front of the bullet for you. Mary chose that. It was always her way. No one could tell her anything to do. She was always going to do what she was going to do. It didn't matter what I said or you said. She chose to do that. Mary did it, not you. You see, right now, you and I are in a situation where we're like, well, is this my fault? And I'm not sure this is your fault and my fault. The question is, how are we going to live through that? Then there's this amazing statement that comes out of Sherlock's life. The tension drops when John Watson says that to him. And this is what Sherlock said. I had to write it down because it so impacted me. He said, Watson, in saving my life, she conveyed a value upon it. It is a currency I do not know how to spend. See, you and I are in a season where we get to look back on our lives through the lens of God's glory. God's son gave his life for you and I. And we're trying to figure out how do we spend a life that has such value. How do you and I spend our life in light of that? How do you live in a world? And right now, a lot of the things that have been really important to you and I have been stripped away. All the things that were important to us before, we're not allowed to get to. So what if you and I humble ourselves and we begin to think about it the same way Sherlock did? What if we began to evaluate, well, what is it that God's doing? And if He gave His life for me, how am I supposed to live? That's why this is such an important season. That's why it's an important time. You are valuable. Your life is precious. You're important to God. You're important to this big picture that's going on. And let's lean into that. Let's take some time to really investigate what that means. My father as a veterinarian taught me the importance of having techniques, strategies, and processes. See, when we were trying to help an animal that it was wounded or sick get back to health, there were certain techniques at times that we had to use or processes and strategies to make all that work. Well, in the same way, for you and I to grow spiritually, there are techniques, processes, and strategy. The other thing that I learned from my dad was this, that learning always takes effort. And in that process of learning and growing and making a change, well, at the same time, consistency becomes important. Have you ever tried to imagine that, well, I'm just going to grow spiritually because I want to? It doesn't really work that way. We can want something and desire something, but it doesn't mean that just because we want it, it's going to happen. You have to be intentional. You have to make a plan. You have to have a strategy. Somehow you have to put that all together. Just because I want to lose weight doesn't mean I will lose weight. I've either got to make some effort in lowering my calories or I've got to find some way of, of working out. And for us to do this, it's going to take some effort, some learning and some consistency to have a lasting change in our life. So we want to take the next five weeks with you. Actually, four weeks, because today is our first week. Wow, check that off. You've got week one already done. That's amazing, isn't it? You and I are already in the process just by being here with me now. It took effort, learning, and consistency to really make lasting health happen for those animals. So every day we had to make sure that they were getting the right food and the right things that they need. Sometimes we imagine that somehow just because we want to grow spiritually, we will grow spiritual. It doesn't happen that way. You have to become intentional about it. In the same way that you won't just become healthy in your body, just because you want to, you actually have to put some effort forward. You have to lower your calories and up your exercise. You have to have a plan. And what I've learned over the years is this. 
If I do it with other people, it works better. That's why we're gonna do this together. I want you to know this. I'm in it with you. I live here in Columbus. I'm part of a Christian community. There are lots of us right now who are trying our best to find out what God is doing and to stay close to Him. So here's our plan. Here's the strategy we wanna invite you to. First of all, I want you to pray. I want you to find a way to make prayer a part of your day throughout your day. Maybe you wanna do like I do. I like to light a candle. And every time I see that candle in the room, it reminds me I'm praying today. I know what I'm praying for. And when I see the candle, I smell the candle. It just kind of encourages me to pray. Or maybe you're a mom at home. Maybe you're a little overwhelmed. The kids are here. You're still trying to do online work. You've got to do laundry. My gosh, you're learning how to do new math and to teach it to your kids. The homework is overwhelming. Well, what if you do this? Every time you do a load of laundry, you pray. You go into the laundry room, you're there alone, and you say, God, I am so humbled by this. I don't know what to do. I need your strength. I need your help. Really lean in to God at this time and seek His help and trust Him. Number two, I want you to read the Bible with me. Do what the disciples did. And begin to look at the scripture and see if it's got a truth, an insight for every day that you're going through. This week, we're gonna read John chapter 12, one chapter a day until next Sunday when we get to John chapter 19. It's the Easter story. It's the story of, of Jesus in Jerusalem. It will overwhelm you how much He loves you and cares for you. And get a friend that's gonna read it along with you. Talk to him on the phone and say, did you read the chapter today? How's that going? What do you think that means? What's he trying to say? And then thirdly, plan on meeting me here. Be here next week on Sunday at the same time on Channel 4, and we're going to take the next step together. We're going to become consistent in, number one, talking to God, number two, in reading His Scripture, and meeting together. It'll be exciting what God will do as we start this consistency and working out this plan together. Remember this, I'm in it with you. I'm here in Columbus. We're going through this together. I want to remind you of some of the words that Jesus said. It actually comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. Jesus is talking to the people about worry. He says, you guys get way too worried about the food that you eat, the clothes that you wear, the house that you live in. He says, don't worry about that. Everybody does that. He says, if you will seek God, if you will seek His righteousness, His peace, and His joy, all that will be taken care of. The reason we're inviting you to this process is this. If you and I will seek God, He's going to take care of all the things we're worried about right now. And I want you to know something. I'm a pastor. I've been there with so many people over the years. And I believe that if we do that, I've seen it over and over and over again, that God shows up when we seek Him, when we cry out to Him, when we talk to Him, when we're just real consistent and faithful and saying, God, I love you. I need you. It's Palm Sunday. I want you to take a moment and just say, God, I want to celebrate you. I want you to know, God, you've got my attention. That's how I feel. I feel like everybody in the world right now is saying, okay, God, you've got our attention. Well, let's take that time. That's why I want to be with you for the next few weeks. I want to invite you, if I could be a help to you, to send me a text right now. You can text the word CONNECT, just type out those letters and send them to me at 614-214-2144. We'll get the message. We'd like to pray for you. We would like to be in this with you if you want to do that. We're here to encourage you, to pray with you. We want you to know that we're here. God is here. He's moving in this situation. Let's not give up on Him. Is there any reason that you might want to take a step towards God today? I'd like to help you with that. It's as simple as a prayer. I'll tell you what, let's just say it together. I'll bow my head and I'll say the words and you say them right along, right after me. Heavenly Father, I believe that you love me and that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for me. And I want you to know, I don't understand it all, but I need you, I welcome you to come in today be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. 
The words aren't as important as your heart and you invite Jesus and God to come in and transform your life today. I want you to know before I go today that we've been praying for you. Not just me, but our church and the other pastors in Columbus. You know, I have dozens of pastor friends here and we've been praying for Columbus. We've been praying for a moment when everybody in the city would know that God is moving, that everybody is valuable, that, that they are loved and they are important. And we are kind of sensing that he's got our attention right now. And so I want you to know this is a great time to lean into God. Begin this prayer process and reading the scripture with us and just really know that God cares about you. He, you are not forgotten that your life is important and, and that you've got a role to play in the midst of all this. And we're inviting you to be a part of what he's doing in our city at this time. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And we don't know everything you're doing, but we sense clearly that you're doing something. And today we bow. We bow our heads and we humble ourselves before you and we ask you to forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for entertaining ourselves. Forgive us for forgetting our families and becoming too busy. And we want to say thank you, God. Because lately we've had focus and we've sat with our families and we celebrate the dinners we've had together, the time we've had together at home. And God, help us to draw near to you too at this time. And would you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us? Help us to begin to understand the scripture and how it relates to our life. Would you help us to begin to imagine how our life might be different if we said yes to you more often? than we used to. And God, would you have mercy on us? Would you break the hold of this coronavirus, begin to cause it to, to break up and go away, Lord? May, may, the, may the death toll decrease and the hope increase as we seek you. And Father, bring to our mind the, the people that you want us to reach out to and call and, and, and check on over the phone during this time. Lord, let us be faithful and not just loving you, but also loving our neighbor. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I hope you felt like God has met with us today. And I hope you've been encouraged and inspired and challenged. And I hope you're ready to take with us these three steps this week. You're going to start praying. You're going to start reading one chapter of John. And yes, you're going to meet with me here next week. Hey, I want to invite you to check out our website, thechurchnextdoor.org. There's more videos and more content there. Just enjoy yourself and plan on this. Mark your calendar. Be here with me next Sunday at noon on NBC4. And we're going to continue to get to know God better and grow through this difficult time. Remember, we're in it with you.